Yeah, um, thanks Lawrence, because uh, you've done all the groundwork really and set this up for me. So what you're going to see in my presentation is a lot of material that, that Lawrence has already uh, introduced. And so my job would be to, to try and embellish on that and uh, bring the concepts out more clearly, I hope. So we'll, we'll cover five areas and uh, we'll start with uh, some key terms including synchronicity. As I say, Lawrence is, uh, has defined some of these already. Um, so, uh, and many of you are familiar with parapsychology anyway, and you know a lot of these terms already. So, my apologies to, to those for whom this will just be revision, really, and we'll go through uh, quickly to get um, through that and uh, move on to the more uh, uh, critical aspects. Uh, second thing we'll do is I'll contrast synchronicity with meaningless chance groupings. We'll merge the two concepts, synchronicity and psi. Uh, this is something that's been ongoing because there's a debate over what synchronicity is um, and what psi is, which is shorthand for paranormal effects. Um, there's a, a, an ongoing debate um, over whether the two are the same thing or whether they should be kept poles apart. Then I'll describe the Chinese system of divination, the I Ching. Um, in synchronistic terms, I'll discuss the frequency of synchronicity and the usefulness of the concept. Okay, so defining parapsychology. Uh, it's the study, as most of you know, of paranormal phenomena. And paranormal just means not explained by science as, as so we understand science to be at this stage. Uh, it may uh, eventuate one day that paranormal is just going to become normal once we understand how it works and, and um, there's a consensus that it is normal. Uh, now, uh, J.B. Ryan was introduced to you earlier. In that photo there, we can see a picture of Louisa as well, which, uh, who, is, uh, who was his wife. Uh, they're, they're both now deceased. They both worked in uh, biology originally, um, but uh, J.B. Ryan was doing the more quantitative things. He was looking at card guessing in so many different forms and variations, all to look at, uh, ev to find evidence for ESP. And he um, designed many different types of dice throwing experiments to get evidence for psychokinesis. Um, Louisa, on the other hand, uh, spent a lot of time receiving loads and loads of letters from people from the United States and all over the world. And from those letters, she classified all the various types of experiences that people were having. So they, that between the two of them, they were covering parapsychology in many different aspects. Um, now I've introduced that term psi already, so paranormal process and psychic ability are collectively referred to as psi, and we use the Greek symbol psi um, as a, sh a shorthand term for that. You probably also know that extrasensory perception, or ESP for short, and um, psychokinesis, or PK for short, are, are the two main forms of psi. E ESP breaks down into three categories, that's telepathy, which I think everybody knows these terms, um, tele telepathy, clairvoyance and precognition. The telepathy is straight mind-to-mind -mind communication, clairvoyance is distant seeing, so it doesn't involve another mind necessarily, it could involve uh, your experience of what's happening in another part of the world um, or in some other remote area or in the next room and you have no normal sensory modalities telling you what's happening. And precognition is future telling, seeing the future. Um, well, we also study life after death, and that's going to be an area that, we'll, that uh, our other speakers will look at after the tea break. So we're actually covering all, all three aspects of parapsychology today, today, which is ESP, PK, and life after death. Now we'll go to Jung's concept of synchronicity, which as you know, um, or may know, is, um, is a collapsed version of ESP and PK. In other words, Jung was claiming that ESP and PK are synchronicity. And um, it, from a point of definition, it's a psychophysical phenomenon. That's the term that Lawrence used earlier. Psychophysical just means mind and, and the world out there, the physical world out there. So the, the, the mind or the psyche is not a physical thing, it's more a, a spiritual or mental or mind thing, and um, the, the physical obviously is the, the hard uh, matter of the world and uh, events in the world. So there's this connection, psychophysical connection. It's a coincidence of two ev events. One is subjective, and uh, which is happening in your mind, and the other is objective or physically observable out there. And uh, as Lawrence also raised, um, 
it's not synchronous. We're talking about synchronicity, which which uh, strips away that problem of of two things ha having to occur at the same time. There can be a, a time displacement. Uh, that's either into the future or for the other event, or even into the past, actually. Uh, synchronicity is experienced when uh, a certain content in the psyche and a physical event or events of equivalence are made conscious. So uh, the equivalence, as the word suggests, means they match or there's a similarity. Synchronicity does not seem to result from chance, even though it generally appears as chance. And Jung was careful here because he used the term chance-like. So he was saying, you may observe it as a chance event, but don't assume it is just happening like chance. And uh, I'll go into a bit more detail about uh, why it might not be chance and how we would measure that. Uh, two more things. Synchronicity is a, co a coincidence in time of two or more causally unrelated or a causal events. That's the other uh, a major point that has to be stipulated here. And uh, they have to have the same or similar meaning. That's uh, the meaningfulness component. So we're already pulling away because of these uh, requirements, we're already pulling synchronicity away from uh, everyday coincidence. So synchronicity is not time dependent, as I mentioned, and it's meaningful. The synchronistic components form the basis of the meaningfulness, which is the only connecting principle between the events. There's no causal connection. Now, some philosophers object. This is, uh, of, of, you know, that had to happen, didn't it? This is Anthony Flew. And he says, uh, and, and this kind of relates to some of the images and ex examples that Lawrence has raised and some examples that I will give. Surely, there's, if it's um, a coincidence, the meaningful must, meaningfulness must be embedded in there or you wouldn't notice it. Let's look at meaningfulness there, then and just pull that apart and see if that statement has any bearing for us in terms of synchronicity. Well, he says, aren't all coincidences meaningful, in other words? Well, here's a couple of examples. You've got a rabbit and a kitten. Um, what's meaningful about that? It's a bit like the three birds forming a smiling face. Uh, it may be meaningful to a person if there's the inner psychic connection. But for me at this very moment, I'm seeing a rabbit and a kitten that are very similar in their, pat pat you know, in their patterns, their colorings. Um, the washing machine face, uh, another thing that some people might not observe, and if you do observe, it might just be comical and that's the end of it. There's, there's nothing more to, to come from that. Um, so those sorts of things that don't really jump out as synchronicity are often referred to as meaningless chance groupings. The two buttons on the washing machine and the towel that's hanging, the red towel that's hanging out of the, the front loader there, uh, yeah, it's a face, but it's just, it's just a chance grouping as well. In a nutshell, meaningful coincidence, uh, that is, synchronicity, does more. Um, it compensates unconscious one-sidedness, and I'll give examples later. It expresses a specific archetypal meaning as an expression of the self in one's individuation. So I'm throwing a lot of terms at you, so sorry, but we'll get to um, explanations of those shortly. Uh, individuation uh, refers to the development of the individual personality. And meaningfulness emerges as part of that process. And so you must ask the question, do all coincidences do that? Surely not. But how do we determine meaningfulness? So it's all right to throw up these examples, but um, we also need some way of uh, making sense of, uh, of that world, of, that, of those experiences. So meaning making draws on the functions of sensation, thinking, feeling and intuition. And these are also from Jung, um, Jung's theory on personality and how the ego uh, mediates his environment or her environment. Sensation tells you that something's out there. Thinking tells you what it is. Feeling tells you whether it's agreeable or not. Do, do you like it or don't you like it? And intuition tells you what you do with it. What do you make of it? Uh, what are the possibilities and potentialities of the experience. And if you use those in combination, you can reach an understanding of synchronicity. Ultimately, you get your, your meaningfulness from synchronicity if there's a transformation of personality, and that's a, a key point. If it's not really shifting you or moving you from a certain position in life, it hasn't really served the purpose of synchronicity. And you may be dealing with a mean, meaningless chance grouping. 
Um, this Garib beetle example that Lawrence gave is an example of that. Uh, so Jung saw the transformation, uh, this transformation as the embodiment of the individuation process. So I think you're begging for examples now. So um, let's go through one. This is from uh, the film Michael Clayton, which came out in 2007. In the film, Michael Clayton is a fix-it man for a law firm. He has enemies, his life is a mess. He can't realise his full potential. His son Henry asks him to read Roman Conquest, a manual for a computer game. The manual shows horses under a tree in a field. And there's a, there's a shot there and the camera spends a good deal of time establishing that shot in the viewer's mind. But that doesn't mean those who saw it remember it and apply it later. Um, now later on in the film, while driving in, on a country road, Clayton sees horses in a field and he, he recalls that picture he saw in the, in the um, computer game manual. So he, he pulls up on the roadside and leaves his car to go to them. Right when he's on the horizon there near those trees where the horses are, his car explodes, triggered by his enemies. He starts a new life where he makes his own choices. Um, now, some people might say that's just meaningless chance groupings. Yeah, well, he could, he could have just kept driving and ignored what he'd seen before. So the meaningfulness is obvious to Clayton, but let's break it down. Jung claims synchronicity postulates a meaning which is a priori, in other words, pre-existent, in relation to human consciousness. It apparently exists outside us. Again, some philosophers object. He says, nature does not dictate how we individuate events. So in the case of Clayton, he's saying uh, anybody could have interpreted those events in a completely different way, but I'd challenge anybody to, to do that in that case. Um, he, he's really saying, uh, Stephen Browdy, that um, you know, aren't, aren't your interpretations of the world subjective? Aren't Clayton's decisions subjective as well? Do we all agree with him? I would say not necessarily. And why? Well, Jung recognises subjectivity, but his focus is mainly on archetypal meaning. The meaningfulness that comes with archetypes is more universal or human-wide. This is a meaning... Oh, sorry, that is, if the meaning is archetypal, it's generally meaningful. So it has application to humans uh, generally in, in large groups, so, um, or even across cultures. So that Michael Clayton example, I think, is really glaringly obvious. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of room for interpretation. But just what are archetypes? Because Jung said you actually need archetypes in uh, synchronicity because they make the experience more numinous and more profound. Um, so we'll have a look at those. He also says archetypes are structural components of the collective unconscious. They're, they're deep in the mind. In other words, we're born with them a little bit like instincts or basic drives. And these influence how we think and act. They're represented in literature, myths, folklore, fairy tales, sacred texts, dreams and fantasies. And the, the more common examples are hero, wise old man and child. And in, in our popular culture hero, we've got like um, James Bond, wise old man, Obi-Wan Kenobi or the, the wizard in Lord of the Rings and so on and um, child is quite common as well lots lots of stories um, uh, about ch children playing the role of a hero as well in going through life's um, challenges archetypes are not just living beings and, and human human or animal that we can relate to they take uh, they go down to very basic structures like geometrical forms two-dimensional or three-dimensional gemstones, for example, flowers and trees. The persona is also an archetype. That's the, the mask we wear or the, the personality we carry around with us when we mediate other people. And animals as well, horses especially, and lions and so on, powerful animals. Now when these appear um, in our everyday world, you're not really looking for the archetypal unless there may be a synchronicity has been activated or whatever, but they have a particular a, a place in our, in our culture, in, in legends and stories and myths and fairy tales and so on. And, and in that context, the archetypal components are usually quite strong. So um, archetypal meaning is an age-old meaning because it's been with us for as long as we've been around. They carry uh, the same general meaning across cultures, as I mentioned. Human experience, how we perceive, and human behaviour, how we act, are thereby standardised. Now that's helpful because it puts us all on the same page. 
So although meaningfulness is largely subjective and requires interpretation, archetypal meaning, because it's in the culture, even carries across cultures, is more objective. And that's the objectivity that we were looking for, as I mentioned, by putting us on the same page. So we get agreement on what psychophysical events may mean, and it, it applies to the transformation of personality too. So if, if somebody says, I, I've had this uh, synchronicity experience and this is the kind of thing that's happening to me, uh, you would tend to get agreement from other people, and if the interpretations are slightly wrong, um, other people can bring their experiences in, then you can fine-tune it. But it, it would be probably a very rare case that there's total disagreement and nobody knows what, what's happening to whom. Now, I'm going to contrast synchronicity with some uh, meaningless chance groupings again. Uh, first of all, an, um, an example of synchronicity. I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, who Emanuel Swedenborg was. He was a scientist, philosopher and mystic, and, re and mainly a re religious leader. In, in 1759, he was at a party in Gothenburg. Um, in an agitated state, he had a vision of houses on fire nearly 500 kilometres away in Stockholm. Now, Jung says, when the vision arose in Swedenborg's mind of a fire in Stockholm, there was a real fire raging uh, there at the same time, 500 kilometres away, without there being any demonstrable or even thinkable connection between the two. And this is before radio and television and newspapers. Um, Sweden, well, they had newspapers, but they didn't come out too quickly. Swedenborg gave dinner guests and later the Gothenburg city authorities an account of this fire, including such details as the time of the fire and when it was put out. He was even relieved that the fire stopped three doors from his own house. It took two to three days for news from Stockholm to reach Gothenburg by courier. The fire had consumed 300 houses. And Jung makes a point of this fire that was burning in Swedenborg too as being the prime ingredient of the synchronistic event. Remember we were saying that in synchronicity you need some inner psychic um, a, a trigger. This was borne out in Swedenborg's biography whereby his psychological state gives indication of the likelihood of an inner fire which can be typified as fear or anxiety and Swedenborg was that kind of person and he had uh, those kinds of problems in his life. That also separates him out from the dinner guests because um, they didn't have the fear and anxiety whereas uh, because of this emotional component in Swedenborg he was more uh, open to synchronicity than, than the dinner guests, otherwise they'd all be having the same, same vision. But certain uh, parameters have to, be, um, uh, have to pre prevail in, for, for synchronicity to click in. So we've got the archetype of fire um, in myth, and uh, that's an example of, is it Belrog from Lord of the Rings? Uh, I mean, uh, there's a sort of a, um, animated um, form of fire and you can see it as representing fear, anxiety um, and destruction. Swedenborg's inner or spiritual fire is a particular meaningful psychological significance and is not simply a typical side phenomenon uh, like clairvoyance, although Jung believed that ESP and PK share the same phenomenology as synchronicity. So the key to synchronicity, synchronicity is the inner outer link. I want to give you an example of a coincidence which we wouldn't readily call synchronicity. It's the birthday paradox. Two strangers meet up in a room full of people and discover they have the same birthday. So should we call that synchronicity? Well, the probability of two people having the same birthday is very high, 99% in a room of only 57 people. So the graph below shows the approximate probability of at least two people sharing a birthday amongst a certain number of people. So you can see from about 60 onwards, it's almost guaranteed. And that's the formula um, of explaining how it works. Um, I, I'm still surprised at that, but you know, you can, the stats don't lie, the maths doesn't lie. Um, now two people meeting up and having the same birthday in a room full of people is not synchronicity because there's no simultaneous uh, meaningful subjective event. We only have a meaningless chance grouping, a coincidence in the conventional sense piling up more and more shared facts, example, they are the same gender or they receive the same birthday present, won't necessarily turn it into synchronicity. In order to satisfy the conditions of synchronicity, an inner psychic experience would be require, required from at least one of the two people directly relating to the events at hand, say a precognition of the event, or any other kind of paranormal or causally inexplicable component. Plus we'll need um, some kind of archetypal content which would help drive home the, the meaningfulness. As I said for Jung, uh, synchronicity is psi or ESP and PK. 
Just how similar are they? The physical events may occur at the same time as an experience in the psyche, even at distances outside the range of the normal sensory modality. So that compares with telepathy and clairvoyance. Synchronicity is not time dependent, where cause must precede effect, so that compares with precognition. Synchronicity is not dependent upon spatial determinants, which compares with psychokinesis. A good uh, PK example of synchronicity is uh, the Freud and Jung example where they were having an argument and Jung said, I felt a, a burning in my belly. And um, in the mid middle of the argument, uh, Freud's bookcase just popped. There was, a, there was a, like, a loud banging noise coming from the bookshelf. And Jung said, I predict it would happen again, and it did. So that's an example of a, like a psychokinetic effect, um, that you, you're getting a, like a physical explosion and the, and the psychic component is this explosion between these two great minds who can't agree on something. So synchronicity is like ESP and PK, but there are, there's other similarities. Synchronicity, um, like synchronicity, psi can appear as a chance-like effect. Both are determined approximately. Notice I said chance-like. Um, psi can be meaningful, and affective emotional expectation is present in one form or another in an, EMP, in an ESP experiment, even though it may be denied. And like psi, synchronicity can be the subject of experimentation. It's not sporadic and can be repeatable. And there's lots of examples of this, and I'll, I'll just list some of the studies that have been done in this area that um, suggest that synchronicity is not, chance, it's not a chance event and you just, you just can't expect to wait for it to happen and you don't know when it's going to happen. You can actually set it up and demonstrate it in the laboratory. Um, and lots of work done on um, the I Ching, including some of the work that I've done. But um, I, I will just go through quickly what the I Ching is. It's an ancient Chinese system of divination. And um, once again, Lawrence has done, um, given you some, some background work, uh, background um, information on that. This, this is how it works in the, in the most conventional sense. And so I'll just go quickly through it. You ask a question or pose a question in, a mi in your mind, and it shouldn't be a yes, no answer, because the I Ching readings don't give you a yes or no. It just gives you a philosophical perspective and a new way to think about your problem, which will hopefully lead, for a, lead to a solution. It never gives you the answer or tells you what to do. You have to develop that yourself from, from the advice. Then you throw three coins six times to generate a hexagram. There's 64 hexagrams, so, so the point is how do you access um, one of those readings to get a philosophical, out, philosophical outlook. So you use the coin throwing method, which or that's only one method. And each has its own reading, these, these 64 hexagrams, and they're meant to be an answer to a pressing question. Jung says the matter of interest, which is your answer from your reading, seems to be the conf configuration formed by chance events, that's the coin throwing, and the moment of observation, which is your reading. Um, seems to be chance, maybe not. Um, as I say, we've, we've been conducting experiments and we may have some evidence that it can be uh, constructed. Jung's point of view, the hexagram was understood to be an indicator of the essential situation prevailing in the moment of its origins. The 64 hexagrams of the I Ching are the instrument by which the meaning of 64 different yet typical situations can be determ determined. And these 64 readings have a strong archetypal components as well. Um, just so that you understand that um, that's the archetypal aspects um, of the synchronicity. The ancient Chinese mind contemplates the cosmos in a very, sorry, in a way comparable to that of the modern physicist who cannot deny that his model of the world is a decidedly psychophysical structure. So here we see um, the old uh, philosophers and modern physicists coming together and agreeing on certain principles of the universe. Jung is saying the I Ching process might involve synchronicity because they're all throwing around this term psychophysical. So it's time for an I Ching experiment. This is the one that I did in um, the laboratory a couple of years ago. Actually, there's some people in the audience today that were actually in that experiment, so they might remember it quite well. We want to create synchronicity in the lab using what they call a Q-sort grid, and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, to map the psyche so we, we get an inner aspect and correlate that with the hexagram generation, which is the uh, creation of an, a physical event in the environment. And we want to um, see, well, the research question is what parts are played by paranormal belief and meaningfulness in the I Ching. We expect meaningfulness to figure in this. We can't 
objectively determine that. We have to have each person who's in the experiment assess the level of meaningfulness because it's about them, not, not what we think it is. And um, what we find too, as you will see, is that paranormal belief, wh whether you want it or not, whether you believe that it can work for you or not, is, is a crucial component of this. We're starting with these uh, five circles. I, I call this the synchronicity cycle. And the first step is you enter a descriptor pairs and then you go to step two, you generate your six RNG numbers. The RNG means random number generator. Uh, this gives you two trigrams which combine to form a hexagram. And then uh, the, the person who generates the hexagram reads the hexagram reading and then rates that reading for meaningfulness. In, in other words, uh, was that about you? Is, is it pertinent to you? Does it give you an answer to your, to your, uh, that, that sort of resonates with your mental state? Sorry that this is getting so technical, but I, and, um, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. I don't know if that picture comes up very well, but that's um, the 64 descriptor pairs. And what each of the descriptor pairs does is it like, encapsulates the readings, which are quite lengthy. So um, to make the experiment practical, we had to uh, just find the key terms, and then people can go through those key terms and map their own psyche, as it were. So that's the first step. Um, in this, uh, and all the descriptor pairs are randomised. Now this person's gone through all of the descriptor pairs and said, oh, I'm feeling creative, motivated right now. So I'll put that number in the far right because that's the most how I feel. And at the other end, um, the minus seven and the minus seven end is the least how they feel. So what you're building up, um, if you can see there, is like a, a, a Q sort grid in this, in this shape of an inverted pyramid that is a map of the psyche from the most how they feel to the least how they feel. So that's, that's what, what we're trying to do is lock in on the inner psycho psychological state of the person. The second step, so this is all the numbers going in. The second step is we get the random number generator out and the participant clicks the button six times to generate even numbers and odd numbers. Key point here is that people are instructed to take their time and relax through this process and what that should do if you are relaxing and taking your time is give you large RNG numbers. The random number generator numbers should be quite large. People that rush it are expected to produce small random, num random numbers. So you get your six hexagram lines, look up the reading. In this case it happens to be the one that, he, that this person listed first and he rates the meaningfulness, and I would expect him to rate the, the meaningfulness quite high because the reading is for the one that he actually selected and said was most true or how he felt. That's an ideal case and it's not always the case. Sometimes, um, you know, the, the numbers, uh, the, the reading will, uh, will apply to a number that's maybe down here or down there. So, but on average, what you should get is zeros. If there's nothing in this and it's all just hocus pocus, um, then um, the average should be around the zero. We don't expect the averages to be really high, like plus five or plus six. We don't expect them to be that negative either. But chance should tell us that, uh, that the average should fall within zero. So let's look at some results. And we, we want to see if we've got synchronicity or, or psi and um, relate that to paranormal belief and meaningfulness. The first thing we found was that the believer's Q sort score, and that's the score ranging from minus seven to plus seven. Uh, we found that those, whatever their score was, um, and also their RNG scores, which, are the, which is the total um, of the numbers that they got from the six button clicks on the random number generator, they were higher for the believers than for non-believers. And uh, it's, it's 0.3 compared to 0.07 for QSort scores, and for RNG it's 3.45 compared to 0.64, and those differences are significant. So there's a, there's a belief gap. It's working for the believers, but it's not working for non-believers. We found that meaningfulness was higher in believers than non-believers. Now, the thing, and that was significantly different. Um, part of the, that effect is coming from the fact that believers tend to overrate the meaningfulness because they want to believe that it's true about them, but the non-believers do the opposite. It wouldn't matter how true it was for them, they'll, they'll just deny it and, and, and downgrade the, the, the rating, so you get this gap. Um, and also the meaningfulness correlated with direct hitting and binary hitting. The direct hitting means scores of plus seven. Anybody who got a score of plus seven um, tends to have a high meaningfulness rating. And also binary hitting, uh, which is scores of plus six or plus seven. So there's the scores down the, the high end there. It means if you've got, you got a really high score, your meaningfulness 
tends to be high. So let's break it down. We, um, we've got statistical evidence of two psi effects, belief effects, and we've got meaningfulness effects. All these effects are best observed when you look at believers and non-believers separately, as I've shown. Now there's a graph of the two, time, two types of effects, the Q-sort score. The, the RNG scores are high 3.45 compared to 0.64. So that's the, uh, the red line. And the blue, blue line uh, is the RNG score uh, differences for non-believers and, and believers. Um, the, the most prominent effect is the Q, um, sorry, RNG scoring and not so much on the Q, Q sort scoring. But they are significantly different. Uh, and as I said before, the highest Q sort scores had the highest meaningfulness ratings. And meaningfulness effect goes some way towards proving the equation that psi plus the meaningfulness gives us synchronicity. And remember too that uh, participants rate the meaningfulness that, that you decide. So these um, are all personal experiences that the individuals went through in terms of um, uh, the synchronicity experience. I just want to wrap up now with uh, pointing out the importance of synchronicity. Um, as, as I'm already showing, it, it has quite strong bearing in parapsychology. If psi is synchronicity, then parapsychologists have been inadvertently testing synchronicity anyway. Uh, although the approaches are different. Now what most parapsychologists do is they understand psi uh, and study it in the context of consciousness and the mind-body problem and free will in certain contexts, what can be influenced and the limits of it. On the other hand, uh, if, and, if you, and if you take that back to that, that I Ching experiment, you can see what we've been doing there is seeing how, they, how high they can score, what um, the various psychological factors like meaningfulness and um, whether they were a believer or not, what those things have to do with uh, psi effects and, and, and what the limits are, who's, who is it happening for and who doesn't it happen for. But um, synchronicity, synch synchronicity leans towards issues such as non-intentionality in the meaning and holism, the whole system, who's being influenced and why. There's, there's applications in therapy, if we go back to the scarab beetle case, when synchronicity occurs between two people in a clinical setting, then the relationship between therapist and client may change and you may get progress, as uh, the scarab be beetle case demonstrated. We've got the importance of synchronicity in physics. There's Wolfgang Pauli again. He said um, that synchronicity was relevant to the discipline of physics and argued that there's an underlying unity of mind and matter, subjective and objective realities. Uh, in quantum mechanics, um, we get revelations that there's subjective elements in nature, the outcome of quantum processes, um, depend upon the way it's perceived by the observer. And the double slit experiment, for example, that's very popular on YouTube at the moment, there's, there's dozens and dozens of um, uh, videos on, on the double slit experiment. It's really something worth seeing. If you never did high school physics, you might not know of it, but it's, it's an effect in physics, um, in the physical world, that is, massive, uh, 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 that is massively influenced by uh, the conscious observer and, and how he records records his, experiment, his experience doing that experiment. So, and that um, you know, must be seen to be believed. And is 100% is, uh, is reliable too. And in literature, uh, we see synchronicity all the time. We've seen it in, in Hollywood films like Michael Clayton. Uh, here's an example from literature. We've got author, author Norman Mailer who was working on his novel Barbary Coast. There was no Russian spy in it. It's not how he started when he wrote the book. But as he worked on it, a Russian spy became a minor character. Maybe the story wasn't progressing and it, was, and it just was losing momentum, so he needed a, a dynamic character. As the work progressed, the spy became a dominant character. After Mailer finished the novel, immigration services arrested Russian spy Colonel Rudolf Abel, top Russian spy in the US at the time. But the interesting thing is uh, Abel lived in the same building as Mailer, one floor below. So we'll just go through um, the conclusions now to wrap this up. Synchronicity, I, I won't say it involves psi and meaningfulness at this stage, I'll just say, just say it probably involves psi and meaningfulness, but the, the, the experimental evidence suggests the relationship. Synchronicity is not necessarily chance-like, not in the single case anyway, because you don't really know um, whether th th there's something like in the Unis Mundus that um, Lawrence mentioned that is making these amazing things happen or whether it's just 
just a bunch of stuff that happens like Homer Simpson would say. But in the, um, so we can't tell from the single case what's more important is, is the meaningfulness and what you get out of it. But in multiple trials like those experiments, um, we look for statistical significance and um, the outcome suggests synchronicity in a, in a more demonstrable form. Um, there's one commentator in, in the uh, world of synchronicity, who said, Robert Aziz, who says a synchronistic event remains a synchronistic event whether or not its meaningfulness is recognised. And I say, see my next point, which is about Michael Clayton. Um, in other words, synchronicity is probably going on around us all the time. To consider Michael Clayton's close shave. Maybe every day, in our everyday experiences, we're not having our cars blown up and nearly going up with the cars, but we do have close shaves, crossing the street and having cars just miss us or whatever. Um, so it pays to be observant. Um, and when I went to see that film in Adelaide, I said to my friends later, did you spot the synchronicity? And nobody did. They, and I said, remember the scene where he's looking at the handbook? No. So, you know, you, you either spot it because you're attuned to that sort of thing or you, or you completely miss it. So following from that point, the individuation element of synchronicity only comes from conscious awareness. As the psychodynamic theorists tell us, nothing is solved in the unconscious. And that, uh, that example harks back to the Michael Clayton example, you either notice it or you don't. And uh, that concludes the talks. Thanks very much.